I'd like you to visualize two different situations. Situation number one, Voyager spacecraft. It's a, it's a spacecraft we launched back in the 70s, and by now it's past the outer planets and it's leaving the solar system. It's cruising along at really high speed. It's going many tens of thousands of miles per hour heading away from our solar system. That's one object. Second object to visualize, there's a golf ball sitting on the ground and a tiger walks up and whacks the golf ball and off it goes, launches into a beautiful parabolic arc. Very different motions of these two different things, the spacecraft and the golf ball. And what we can do with kinematics is to describe the motions. I just look at them. I say position as a function of time. I can draw a graph. And once I know that, I can calculate velocity as a function of time or acceleration as a function of time. The description of motion of both of those objects is relatively straightforward. But the much deeper question which we want to address is why? Why does the spacecraft travel the way it does at high speeds in a straight line? Its engines are long dead and it's cruising along at these incredible speeds. Why does it do that? The golf ball was sitting still, perfectly happy, sitting there on the ground. All of a sudden, it's launched into a parabola. Can we understand why things move the way they do, rather than just describing how they move? That's a big goal of physics. And the word for the study of why things move the way they do is it's called dynamics, as compared to kinematics, which is merely descriptive. The central idea of dynamics was really articulated by Isaac Newton. Galileo started the process in a very clear way, and Galileo and, and Isaac Newton really finally, for the first time in history, I think, understood the prime ideas of dynamics. So we're going to be talking about Newton's ideas. And Newton's first idea, which is now called Newton's first law of dynamics, is the following. Very simple, very intuitive. At least part of it is very intuitive. An object at rest remains at rest. That's the natural state of affairs of things. And an object in motion continues in motion. So let me, let me try to write that down in a sort of a concise way. Newton's first law is an isolated body. Isolated means let's think about a body that's not being pushed or pulled. And it will maintain uniform motion. And the word uniform is just a word for steady motion. When I talk about an isolated body, I have to explain it in terms of force. Force is a central idea to Isaac Newton. And a force you can think of as nothing more than a push or a pull. When you apply a force to an object, you are pushing it or pulling it. And we're going to quantify forces later. But for now, an isolated body is one which isn't feeling forces. Let me write down Newton's first law in a slightly more long-winded way. It's a little bit more careful statement of Newton's first law. In the absence of a net force, that means that you could be pushing on one side, but if you are also pushing on the other side, equal and opposite, those two forces would cancel out, and there would be no net force. So what happens when there's no net force on an object? A body at rest stays at rest. A moving body continues moving in a straight line with constant speed. That's what uniform motion means. The first one, I think, is very reasonable. It's called the law of inertia. And everybody, I think, can accept that fact. The second part of Newton's first law is rather counterintuitive. Let me convince you that you may not believe this at first. Because you're driving your car down a straight highway. You're in uniform motion. And your foot's on the gas. You are clearly applying a force to the car. What happens if you stop applying a force? In the absence of a force, well, what you think, what's correct, is your car slows down, comes to a halt. Okay? That's not in disagreement with Newton's first law. Because you're not thinking about the net force. What you're thinking about is one of the forces, the force, say, of the, of the engine pushing the wheels. The, the subtlety of exactly what's applying that force is something we'll get to. You could just think of the force as coming from your foot on the accelerator pedal. When you ease your foot off the pedal, 
there is still a force on the car. It's friction. All cars, everything in the ordinary world always experiences friction. And it's the frictional force, which is just another force of nature, which is causing the car to slow down. For many, many years, people didn't really think about friction as a distinct and separate force. It's so ingrained, it's kind of hidden, it's always present. If you don't really think explicitly about friction, it does seem like the natural state of objects is at rest and moving objects will come to a halt. But that's because of friction. If you could just eliminate friction and ask what is the deep underlying motion of objects, you would discover experimentally that Newton's first law is absolutely correct. Galileo was the one who really first did these experiments and saw that when you drop a marble down a track and then watch it moving with very low friction, it will continue in motion.